Good afternoon. I'm John Dooley, uh, Elon's, Elon's Vice President for Student Life, and I want to welcome you to our second community town hall. I'm joined today by President Connie Book and several of our senior staff colleagues, including Provost Aswani Valetti, Vice President for Strategic Initiatives, Dr. Jeff Stein, Vice President for Inclusive Excellence, Dr. Randy Williams, and Vice President for Access and Success, Dr. Jean Radigan Rohr. So far, we've received more than 170 questions and comments, and they've been good ones. And if you're watching this on Elon Live, there's a form on the page for you to submit additional questions while you're watching. Your questions are important to us and help us understand what's on your mind. So thank you for taking the time to raise important issues. As we did last week, we've grouped some of the questions we received in advance into topics so we can try to efficiently cover as much information as possible. Uh, and again, this week, perhaps not unsurprising, the largest number of questions we received, especially from students and families, relate to the unusual semester and the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I'm going to start with President Book. Um, and President Book, we've had several questions about how we're helping students to thrive and make social connections and stay mentally healthy this semester. And I want to give you an example of one question from an Elon parent. And it reads, our freshman daughter finds herself very isolated socially since orientation ended. Since it is difficult to meet other students during class due to masks and social distancing, we are very concerned about her mental health and lack of connectedness. We all know that students who make strong connections outside of class to other students do better and are happier than those who spend all their time alone. How does Elon plan to find more proactive ways to bring first year students together virtually or in small groups to continue to build such connections despite the pandemic? So President Book, I know that this has been on your mind uh, can you, how would you talk with this parent about that question? Well, I want to start out by saying uh, that we know that the first six weeks of college are really challenging. The, uh, the research has, is clear, even without COVID, they're really challenging, you know, that um, students arrive, they're, everything's new, um, and it, they're sharing a room. So many, majority have not been sharing a room uh, in today's uh, research shows. So you're, sharing a room and you're actually, you know, three feet away from a person. Uh, and so just that alone uh, is a change. So we're really sensitive to that COVID-19 because of mask wearing, right? So you don't even have the visual of a face um, that's affecting the way we interact with each other. Um, we're also uh, very aware that um, the typical way we designed engagement for students has been disrupted. So uh, we are in much smaller cohorts um, and managing physical space interactions. Um, we still do have those opportunities. It is smaller groups and that in itself, I think can be challenging for a young person to approach a smaller group uh, it can be challenging for any person to, to uh, approach a smaller group and to introduce yourself and to make meaningful connection. I will say that one of the uh, things I've been hearing as I visit in small groups myself with students is um, that they are, the classroom setting has become really important for making those connections. Um, that is something on their schedule and is programmed in a moment they can have where uh, and that's why we know uh, residential education is so powerful These because it's the before class starts and after class starts conversation that, um, you know, at the beginning of class and as you exit class, that can really be important at times for uh, finding our connections with people who share similar interests and also people who engage us in, in uh, different thinking and about what's happening in their lives. I also, and last night, we, what we've done too is create virtual experience. I called bingo last night. Bingo is very popular at Elon. And I was in the studio, but students were playing all over campus um, and uh, in their rooms and uh, joining us. So that was a lot of fun. So we do have virtual spaces uh, that students can engage. Uh, and that does help with isolation and a sense of belonging. Um, Beyond that, our uh, campus rec and wellness leaders, who I also had a chance to visit with this week, um, we're having yoga on the lawn, um, using our outdoor spaces um, to be able to support that. Some of those have been, uh, for this two weeks, because of the social hiatus, not offered. 
uh, but there's still plenty of outdoor activity available. We have a driving range, um, a little putting green. Um, we play um, cornhole. We're having movie on the lawn tonight uh, where students can spread out and wear their masks, but enjoy um, Despicable Me, I think is what the selection is tonight. And then if a student is feeling especially anxious, um, we have worked very hard over the last three years to enhance our counseling services for students. And not just one-on-one -on -one counseling, we are now offering workshops, uh, group workshops about ways to connect, about our nutrition, about taking care of ourselves from a time management um, perspective. Uh, there's one just on the stresses of COVID. Um, and these group workshops I find are also uh, great places to connect and safe spaces to share how you're feeling at this time. And, and she is not alone. Um, there are uh, hundreds of other college students who also are experiencing uh, this challenging time and we're here to support that. And that's certainly something that we hear um, even in a non-COVID year, um, the kinds of questions that this parent is asking. And you know, you've been, uh, President Book, a faculty member on campus and you've been a champion for Elon 101 and the residential experience. Um, you're an Elon parent. Um, and so just like, you know, parent to parent, what would you say to a parent who, who's feeling that phone call from that student that says, I'm feeling lonely, I'm feeling disconnected. Is there advice that you would give that parent? You know, I always remind, uh, you know, I tend to say, and my son says, you're not alone, you know, um, and, uh, and with my daughter as well, and share my own college journey. That's helpful too, if you've been and had similar experiences or how you approached a new job or um, a new and the reminder that it, um, it you know, that it does get better. Um, and uh, to reach out to the support system that we have here, like an Elon 101 peer mentor, that TA, the orientation leaders stay in contact with uh, our first year students. And personally, um, and this is not for every student, but our um, faith-based organizations here too are stand ready to help Catholic, um, our Catholic student ministry and Hillel. And we have several groups to support um, students. So I, I, I always tell my, my children, you're not alone in this and share some of my own personal journey where I'm faced with uh, something new and challenging. We just got a question that came in about um, Elon finding creative and um, socially distanced activities for students um, during this hiatus. And, um, and you referenced that president book, some of the things that are happening from student involvement in other places. Um, and the original question really did sort of frame this in what Elon might do. Um, Dr. Radigan Roy, I'd like to maybe bring you into the conversation. You and I have talked previously about that transition from high school to college and, and what a student may experience and, and those um, feelings of loneliness. And I, I wonder if you have some thoughts about um, how students are coping or strategies that students might use? Well, I think the first thing we need to acknowledge is that this is a very difficult time for young people who, to be quite honest, are probably at the most social time in their life. I mean, college by its very nature is a place to develop and promote social interactions, right? So yes, as um, President Book inferred in a time when what is normal and or regular has now been upended, some students are grasping and finding it difficult to connect. We notice here in the center that um, students who are making friends, they're making friends in smaller and smaller groups as, as, as President Book uh, um, inferred earlier. But they're also making smaller groups, meetings with study groups or, or just friendship groups as well. But in my experience, the students I see who are most successful in connecting with others are students who have figured out how to make the best and most effective use of their resources. Um, you mentioned earlier Elon 101, and it could also be the RAs or mentors. There is this great video on the center's website about why mentors in college are important and how to go about finding them. It's a recording of a Zoom session we did with about 100 um, Elon students two days ago, actually. 
this on the Center for Access and Subsets website. And in that video, we have Elon alumni talking about what it was like for them to find mentors here on campus. And I encourage you to check it out because I think now more than ever, it, 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 I, I channel our president um, emeritus, Dr. Leah Lambert, who, who says, a college students look, need to look for a consolation of mentors. And I think finding a consolation of mentors at this time more than ever is going to be vital for our students to help make those connections. And I know that that can be scary and difficult uh, for students. And so again, yeah, I think that's good advice, Dr. Riding Award, to realize that you're not alone, um, as Dr. Book said, and, um, and to take advantage of the resources that are available and to sort of push through that. So good advice. We've had some very specific questions about our COVID-19 strategies and policies, and I, I wanna offer a couple here. One student asked, if we do go into quarantine, will we have the option to go home? Uh, another student asked, how many, space, how many quarantine spaces does Elon have prepared for students? Many students rely on numbers to feel as though they have a grasp on what's happening. And I think that providing this number would ease a lot of students' confusion over how the level system is working, how the decision is made, uh, on what level that we are on. So for these questions, um, I'm gonna to turn to our resident COVID-19 expert, uh, Dr. Jeff Stein, uh, who is chairing the Ready and Resilient Committee. And uh, Jeff, if you have some insights on, on these two questions or, or our COVID efforts in particular. Certainly, thanks, John. In terms of uh, the notion or the question about if we would, as a campus, go to campus quarantine for two weeks, uh, I mentioned some of this in the town hall last week, but. We all need to remember that the CDC, as well as state, local, and, and national health officials strongly discourage travel if a campus needs to uh, go on a two-week quarantine. And let me explain that a little bit. Um, they ask that students remain on campus in order to keep others safe, like family members. Uh, all of us want our children close or want our families nearby in such a situation. Uh, but the risk of spreading the virus is just too great uh, and would only put friends and family members and others uh, during our travels at risk or in danger. So I mentioned last week also that we learned uh, a great deal by speaking to a couple of campuses uh, that went through this process, a, a two-week campus quarantine, like Notre Dame, for example. We called them uh, after they had experienced this, and they were really clear that they learned that student well-being and campus safety are tough to balance, but it can be done. Uh, so I would maybe end this part uh, reminding people that such a quarantine, while focused and controlled uh, and, and really being about significantly limiting contacts, contacts it, it doesn't mean that students are locked in their room. Some call this a lockdown, that's not what it is. Um, you know, students must, they, they have to be outside, they have to go pick up meals, they might have to get an important prescription uh, in the mailroom, and they need to study. And those things have to happen even in a campus quarantine. And, um, you know, those, these other institutions describe to us that this is, a, while managed and controlled, it's, it's not a prison sentence. And so uh, while we want students to stay here, um, it's something we can get through together. Uh, you mentioned about quarantine spaces. I was just going to say quickly that we actually aren't complete. We, we don't have a limited number of quarantine spaces. So um, unlike many campuses, we're really fortunate that we have more than 700. And you probably know this number better than I do, John, but something like 780 plus students living on campus in single rooms with private bathrooms. So any of those students, if they needed to quarantine, could quarantine in their living space. But uh, we're also holding empty a number of other single rooms with private bathrooms on campus. And then I think everyone knows that at any given time, we have uh, rooms that we are holding at two to three local hotels. And I say that because um, in, in September, we decided to add you know 20 rooms at this particular hotel. And then a couple of weeks ago, we added 20 additional rooms at a, another hotel. And so we've been really fortunate to be able to expand uh, that capacity as we've seen the need. That's I think helpful for folks to understand. 
I um, also want to follow up with you, um, Dr. Stein. Um, last week, you announced the social hiatus to try to, to slow the spread of the virus um, after we'd experienced a surge of cases. Uh, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, the steps we took and as you're looking at the information, whether or not we feel like those have been effective. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And um, I talked a little bit last week about the specific steps, but I, I think the most important thing is to say thank you to students, faculty, and staff just for their cooperation and their support in this. Um, this is new for the institution, but it's new for students going through this. Um, everybody made sacrifices, is making sacrifices that have already been discussed today, but um, this was a chore to adopt these steps um, that we've taken to deter the spread of the virus. Um, I think part of the ongoing uh, frustrations that all of us are experiencing is this is a roller coaster, right? So cases go up, cases come down, and we're, we're seeing that here and at other institutions. That's really disconcerting. And I think um, what we're seeing in the social hiatus is really helpful because it's helping us to deal with that roller coaster. We're in day eight, I think, of social hiatus. Um, and it really appears that these efforts are reducing, uh, these efforts to reduce interpersonal contacts and change our behaviors have helped to slow the spread. Um, this hiatus combined with aggressive quarantining and isolation and the targeted testing that we've been doing in the last couple of weeks has helped to reduce the numbers uh, of cases just reported in the past few days, but it's not that simple, right? We need a little bit more time to see the full results and, and it's not an exact equation. I, I think we believe it's working and, and, and I just wanna be very honest and clear that the number of cases we experienced last week and the week prior indicated that there was potential that we could see another surge. And that's why we extended this because uh, we didn't know at the time that really to get the greatest effect and because of the cases that came in a little bit longer, sort of meeting the traditional 14-day uh, period of uh, quarantine would help us. We, we talked uh, quite a bit with our data experts at Cone Health and our infectious disease experts, and they really suggested that if we were to stretch this that we would see a great deal of benefit and, and we'd know that this uh, was working. We'd be able to measure it better. Uh, so as you, you know, said, John, in your email, it's really about vigilance and our personal behaviors. And uh, that'll help reduce the number of positive cases in our community. Um, it's not necessarily fun that we had to pull back on club sports or uh, student athletics or intramurals or things like that, or go to completely grab and go meals. But uh, we do have to limit our close contacts. And what the advice we got was that by sort of pulling back on these other opportunities for contact, we would help to keep this, this number flat. It would really make uh, all the difference. And I just, I just want to say again, thank you. It's stressful, right? We, we heard President Book and Dr. Radding Moore talk about this stress. I just want to remind us that in stressful times at Elon, we've always chosen to come together even more. Um, I, I think it takes, I've always thought it takes first year students three fourths of a year to feel comfortable on campus. And all the additional stress of a national election and um, you know, our work to, to uh, really take on anti-racist uh, work across the institution, across the country, all that is stressful and on top of a regular year. And so um, I've, I've heard people say that these masks make us feel a little bit muzzled or even more, more pushed back from each other and more distant. And I think what I hear President Book and, and Dr. Redding and Rohr saying is, we've got to push even harder, uh, each of us, whether the ones we're the ones needing support or the ones who feel that we're doing okay, we've got to come together and try to support each other and assume that everybody wants this to work and wants uh, us to, to be strong together. I'm just gonna tell you that uh, Mary Morrison who works on campus has been a stalwart supporter of students and civic engagement for years said to me the other day that a student told her that it feels sometimes like we don't all care about each other as much because you can't see our reactions and we can't spend as much time. And I think we've all got to just reach out to each other right now and, and make it clear that we do care about each other and we want everybody here and everybody matters and we're gonna get through this together. 
Thanks, Dr. Stein. And I, and I would say too, with the, the social hiatus, uh, you know, the students who are already fairly conscientious about their behaviors and practices may have experienced only a few changes, but I think it was especially true for those students who'd become perhaps a little bit lax about their own personal choices and behaviors that that probably felt like a, a more significant change for those students. Yeah. Um, you mentioned this, uh, I think briefly, and, and we got a, it kind of relates to a question that just came in um, and it relates to the hiatus and testing. And, and the question is, will students be punished if they test positive and give the contact tracers a large network that they have been in close personal contact with during the social hiatus? For example, the there's only one answer to that question. It's no. Uh, students well-being and mental and physical uh, health is much more important than anything else. And I, I, you could remind me, Dr. Dooley, that, that we have a policy with this term, with a term that we use around this. The medical safety policy. Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. And I would just say, no, in fact, so much better if, if we can do the tracing and find out who's connected and we're a lot less concerned about um, punishment uh, than that uh, safety. And Dr. Stein, we've gotten several questions about testing, and I know you talked about this in the town hall last week, and I wonder if you have maybe just a quick update on where we are with testing strategies at Elon. I will try to be quick. Great COVID-19 question. testing strategies, not class testing <laughs> strategies. Yes, right. Um, this is a huge issue, and um, I, I actually need to thank students, faculty, and staff for participating in our weekly testing, but um, we've had, in the last week, we had at least five different families contact us with contacts all over the country to try to help us with this. Um, LabCorp and Cone Health have been great partners in helping us to test our community. I want everybody to know that. And they do have capacity to continue working with us. Um, the issue really is how do we increase the amount of tests we do each week? Uh, and how do we make, you know, get more rapid results and less expensive tests? Um, I, I think I mentioned last week, we found out recently that there's only three or four of us uh, uh, in terms of private institutions in the state who are doing any asymptomatic testing. And that's because finances are an issue. Those other private institutions can't even afford to test asymptomatically. Um, but it's more than finances. This is a constantly sort of shifting process. This is new for the medical world. And Colleges and institutions and companies are all trying to find increased testing capacity, and there's new tests that people are scrambling after. So just in the last two weeks, we've seen national organizations like the NCAA shift from the focus on PCR tests to the possibility, and PCR tests are considered the gold standard, to uh, antigen tests, and that we may be able to use these faster point-of-care antigen tests for um, the kind of surveillance, even though they're designed for symptomatic cases, that we may be able to ramp that up. And, and uh, we've been working with a partner on antigen tests, probably won't be able to get those like many other institutions until December or January. But, um, you know, again, I'll just say we're narrowing down the possible labs and companies to switch to other PCR options in the next few weeks. We, you know, one hospital, one hospital system, and five different lab companies we talked to this week. Again, many of those coming from parent and family connections. So uh, we thank everybody in this process, and I think we'll see movement sooner than later. We got a quick question that just came in uh, about who is doing the contact tracing for Elon, and that is the Alamance County Health Department, and we work closely with them on the, the tracing of close personal contacts, um, and obviously they, uh, they give the recommendations around quarantine. Um, but we work with them closely. And then the uh, information about the extended contacts comes out from the Dean of Students Office. President Book, I've got another question here that I think you might be able to help with. Um, I know you are doing your best to keep things open. And as a parent, I understand the financial concerns, but some students are genuinely fearful. Some students feel not enough is being done to control gatherings. Some students feel that the administration and faculty aren't listening to their concerns, that there's not enough testing, that they don't trust the data. I'm wondering, President Book, what you think about this issue of trust? And if you have any thoughts about that. I will say uh, we are listening. I just want to start there and, and that our data is accurate and transparent. Um, I think this is one of the challenges we've really seen unfold during COVID-19 is an inherent lack of trust. Um, and, uh, and 
in, in the Elon community as well as in our country. Um, and it has to be in part, um, you know, I, I, when I talk about COVID, I always think about how personal our health situation is. Um, you know, it's deeply personal. Uh, people have suffered real loss. It's a serious disease. Um, and so there is a heightened caution, right? And so in that, if you don't have established relationships with the medical provider, with um, who's making the calls on this, and I think people know too, it's an emerging issue. So um, you're having to trust systems that people are asking all the right questions, that people, um, that people are accessible to answer your questions. Uh, you know, so all of that is part of the ways that we, and that to trust ourselves too, right? That um, when we think about trust in the larger context. Uh, so it, all of those are these gut instincts um, that we um, are attuned to in our lives uh, when we decide when to trust and how to trust is uh, we count on ourselves, we count on our community, um, and we count on the ability to have a back and forth. Um, a dialogue about it as a way to build trust. Um, and in part, that's why I thought these town halls were important. So people could um, get a moment firsthand with the people who I, I'm, I want you to know are carrying this, carrying the concerns. We're listening and we carry those into every decision, every meeting. And while those decisions may not be what the hoped outcome was, um, that you, an individual, had hoped for. I recognize that too. Um, trust me that it was um, given lots of consideration by people who truly are working to the best interest of our Elon community and understand the responsibility of these decisions that we're making, um, that they Im impact people's well being and health. Um, so uh, I hope that is reassuring, but I also know that it's a tough time and I acknowledge that and uh, we want to build trust during this time. That's why we've worked to be transparent and can, will continue to do that. And we will continue to keep our ears and our eyes open um, so that we're learning along the way. And with each new piece of knowledge, I've asked the team to be committed to adjusting our system, right? When we learn something new, um, Let's reevaluate. Let's take. Let's not let that new information go unattended to. So it is. Uh, it is a, a constantly. We're building it, and there's no roadmap. Um, but trust that the people who are at the table are listening, and are giving deep thought to um, to your care and concerns. Thank you. Provost Valetti, I want to bring you in here. Um, we've got a question related to the classroom setting that I thought you might be able to address as the chief academic officer for the university. Uh, and the question reads, how is there no evidence for spread in the classroom setting? How can we say that for certain? Wouldn't it be more prudent to just take our classes online for a week or two? What is the harm in that? Why are you hesitant to do so? Thank you, John. Um, I want to I want to pick up where President Book left off in her earlier comment about uh, the value of a residential and campus experience. Right? Elon is very proud to have the retention rates and the graduation rates we have. You know, uh, 90, 91 percent retention rate, 80, 81 percent graduation in the four years. There are reasons for it, and we are proud of what happened. Not 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 what happens just within the classroom setting, but like President Book mentioned, what happens in conversation with your fellow members and colleagues had it before the class and after the class. And all the other um, uh, structures and support structures require students that contribute to the form. We are blessed to have a, a group of very, very talented individuals who are experts in, in um, health policy, epidemiology, data analytics, and they're doing a phenomenal job um, concept with the Radiant Resilient type team looking at uh, the numbers of infections and where they're coming from and where are they located, uh, where are they living. And so we have fantastic analytics in terms of seeing uh, where the infections are coming from and the student life uh, that you always see working with your office and working with um, other offices and campus, we're able to target and put some preventive measures in place. For example, um, the student care li student, uh, student life is, is doing a phenomenal job in identifying contact tracing uh, working with students and providing isolation, quarantine, those kind of stuff, and, and providing them with the resources. Right? 
And so we are seeing the benefits of this approach. Uh, the infection rates are very, very low, uh, uh, contrary to the, the spike we got a couple of weeks ago. The numbers have been very, very um, good numbers, small numbers. Of course, every case is, is something that we don't want. But having said that, uh, as an institution, collectively, we are managing the situation very, very well. And B, uh, looking at what the students are requesting. While there might be some students and some faculty and staff for that matter, uh, who prefer a remote learning or, or remote teaching, majority of the students are looking for a face-to-face -face instruction. And even in the class I teach, when I talk to the students, that is coming out loud and clear. They came here for a face-to-face -face residential experience. Of course, they also recognize that we are in a COVID situation. It's not ideal, it's not perfect, but they recognize that we are doing things the best we can and they're rolling with the punches, recognizing the conditions they're in. Um, and, and, and third, we do have to recognize that not everybody has the same level of risk tolerance or has the same level of health conditions. So whether it is faculty, staff, or students, we are working, them, working with them individually to make sure that we're accommodating their needs. Uh, perhaps they have some underlying health conditions or perhaps they have somebody they live with at home and they don't want to take the infection home. So working with them, we are making accommodations. So we are working with students who want to have face-to-face -face education. We are working with students who want remote education and, uh, um, um, and, and working with these students. Uh, one thing I do want to say is that we had to separate the fact versus fiction. And we had to be cognizant of people's individual needs and making sure that we are taking their needs into consideration in this case we are. Um, I'm very proud as an institution, we're making data informed decisions. And I want to assure we are keeping an eye on all these numbers and the trends. If conditions warrant, call warrant, we will pivot. But based on the data and the trends we have, staying the course is the best, is the right decision in my mind. Dr. Williams, I want to bring you into this conversation as well, um, and, and related to this point that Provost Aletti made about um, what he's been hearing from students about classes. Um, and Dr. Williams, you and I are both teaching classes this fall in addition to our other duties. And I'm just curious, what are the students in your class saying? Uh, would they rather be online? Would they object to going with remote classes for a couple of weeks? How have you been hearing about this in your class? Yeah, yeah thanks, Dr. Dooley. Um, just for more context for our viewers, you know, we teach in the graduate program. And so we're teaching some graduate students this fall semester, and they're coming in from having experienced it at a number of undergraduate institutions where they're still connected and they're under following what's going on on their respective campuses. So they're in a unique position to have insight on what's going on at their uh, undergraduate institution and how, what they're experiencing here at Elon. Uh, and to add another layer of uh, uniqueness to this is they are also working with students in their apprenticeship spaces as well. And so they have their supervisors that they're in communication with as well as other undergraduate students. And so when they mix all that together, you know, you generate a certain type of reaction and response from our students. So our, our graduate students have, you know, chosen this program to be a part of a cohort education where they have proximity to uh, not just their peers but also to the faculty and administrators here. So there is a desire to be in person. Uh, there's a desire to be connected with one another. Uh, many of the students have chosen this because of the small nature of Elon and our cohorted program. So the students want to be here. Uh, that said, our students are also recognizing the realities of the situation in which we're in. Uh, we're, we're in a pandemic situation. And, uh, and currently there, uh, there's no vaccine right now. And the closest thing to the vaccine we have is you know, those practices from the CDC of wearing a mask and uh, physical distance and washing hands and you know, just great hand hygiene. And so those types of things are important. So they're acknowledging the situation that we're in as well. They're also acknowledging too that uh, the season that we're in, we're entering a period where allergies are becoming, you know, seasonal allergies are becoming an issue and people, you're seeing symptoms that uh, emerge that may present similarly to COVID-19 um, symptoms as well as and other um, uh, medical situations that students and that we encounter. So they're taking all this together, Dr. Dooley and considering, okay, 
what are, what are we hearing from the university? What type of communication do we have? You now, uh, Dr. Stein and Provost Villetti shared a number of things that we're doing. Uh, and that breeds a sense of confidence, a sense of trust. Uh, and, and so that helps to mitigate some worries and some fears that our students have and so that they can sustain in an in-person setting. We also support them and let them know, just like we've done with the undergraduate students, like if there are some serious issues, if they have some major concerns about being in class, we want to hear them. We want to be responsive to them. We want to accommodate your needs as best as possible. Uh, the only thing that's above our academic mission here is safety, you know, emotional, physical, um, and spiritual safety for our, our mental state, mental health for our students. And so that's important. We have to ensure that that is in place. So our students wanting to be here, um, yes, they do want to be here, uh, but they also recognize the situation that we're in as well. And they're monitoring it closely. That's why it's important for us to offer these town halls, the weekly communications and other intermittent uh, messages that come out to the community so that they're staying aware. Um, early, I was speaking with a colleague and sometimes you say, you know, we, we, we in these types of situations, we sometimes fight the things that are in our proximity and our close reach as opposed to fighting the things that we need to coalesce around. And what we have to do collectively is to bridge the gap between uh, of knowledge, what's known and what's not known. And that in a sense will breed some trust and say, okay, you know, I have confidence in this institution which has accepted me uh, here to be here to continue my education. And um, I'm going to trust in that while also, you know, being cognizant and taking res personal responsibility on what I can do to contribute to a healthy engagement as well. So you think about, you know, what students want to go on a two week uh, hiatus or remote learning period. Um, I can't answer that specifically right now. Uh, things are changing so quickly, um, you know, in regarding we meet only once a week and so have that one touch point, just check in and see how students are doing. We offer that every class session. Um, so to, to know if they want to go into this remote setting, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I can't answer with full authority at this point about whether they will want to do that right now. Uh, in my last class session, I didn't think they would say yes, but that was uh, earlier this week and things may have changed since then. So, and that's just reflective of the dynamic nature that we're in that uh, requires us to have uh, a finger on the pulse of what's going on, uh, not just the dashboard, but also engagement with the community, engagement with our students. What are they feeling? Uh, what's the sensation? How are we fear feeling? I mean, we're part of this too. Let's acknowledge that as well. How are we feeling about our competence and our ability to respond in this particular complex and complicated situation? So uh, keeping a, a, a pulse on all of this is important so that we can breed confidence and trust in the community. And, and that keeping pulse is a, is a good point, Dr. Williams. And I know that many of our faculty colleagues here as we're at the midpoint of the semester are doing their normal practice of doing a midpoint check-in with students to see how things are working in class um, and how things are working for, for what they've been doing over the course of the semester for them as well. So um, there will be a lot of those midpoint check-ins happening in classes over the next uh, week or so. Yeah. I wanna to shift to a different topic now. Uh, we received many questions last week about the September 19th caravan that came through campus. Uh, where, some, where some folks involved in that caravan shouted vile and racist insults uh, at different members of our community. Uh, as we announced we would, uh, we have now issued no trespass orders uh, banning six individuals from campus. Uh, we addressed some of these questions last week and they also came up at the SGA fireside chat that President Book and I had with students earlier this week. Uh, but I think it's worthy of addressing a few more of these questions we've received. And so I'm just gonna read a couple. Uh, first, let's be clear, these caravans are not interested in free speech, but quite the opposite, to create fear and intimidation. Please close Haggard Avenue and make it a pedestrian zone for the Elon community. Another question or comment. This was not a political convoy. It was co-organized by a neo-Confederate group, a white supremacist group. Why were they allowed on campus? And a third question. Why was the e-alert system not used to inform students of the harassment and disruption from the motorcade on Saturday and how can we begin using that system to alert students and staff to these kinds of emergent concerns in the future? President Book, you and I've been in several spaces where these kinds of questions have come up and I just wonder if you could offer some of your thoughts on what you're hearing from the questions. Yes, I, I am. And I'll just echo your, um, your uh, 
sentence there, John, where you were talking about the impact that this has had on our campus. There's a lot of hurt. Um, there's a lot of frustration um, and anxiousness about, about this. We have a public street that flows through the, the middle of a very populated quad on campus. And, and just for clarification to the person who asked why were white supremacists allowed on campus, they, are not on, they were not allowed on our campus and are not allowed on our campus. Um, they um, were part of a, they in part of a motorcade that came through down a public street in the middle of our campus. So I just wanna um, stress that point. Um, uh, and uh, we have continued to issue uh, no trespass orders as we are able to identify um, the people engaged in this behavior. Uh, it is um, completely at odds with our values. Um, I have asked a round table to form. Um, we invited those folks and they're having their first uh, meeting on Monday. I've asked them to work quickly. Dr. Rohr is going to serve as a facilitator to that conversation. And the reason I asked for a round table is uh, symbolic. This is different than a committee or a task force. A round table is used to reflect uh, the quality of the persons around the table. Uh, it's intentionally designed to send the signal that we are all equal here in our right to have a safe environment, that every individual um, in our community and in my opinion, in our country, it deserves the right to be free and safe um, as they um, do their studies, their work. Um, and so this round table is designed to reflect that. And so um, we will have uh, representatives from students, faculty and staff, as well as the town of Elon, and talk about how we're gonna to respond to these uh, in the future. And while we wait on that group to finish its work, which it will happen quickly, um, that's, uh, we, I requested that, the group um, that um, we're gonna get this feedback quickly. But in the interim, um, I've instructed to use the e-alert system when we know uh, there is an imminent convoy um, within uh, that's going to be coming through campus. So that will be um, what we will, the rule will follow until our community can set the standard on um, what we should do um, with these events. As I shared, these are um, a new uh, to the landscape um, and are being leveraged. Um, and I agree that uh, loud cars uh, generally even um, without the language and the behavior that we saw can be intimidating. Um, you know, uh, cars and trucks and motorcycles and uh, those vehicles all can cause an anxiousness and um, when they're gunning their engines and honking their horns. And so the round table will take that discussion up and I'm looking forward to their recommendations. We also submitted a proposal to the town of Elon to ask for temporary closures of Haggard Avenue for the rest of the semester. Um, this would allow, um, it would be safer during this environment for our campus. Uh, it would allow us, we have um, also added pressures about needing space outdoors. So it would also uh, facilitate our ability to be outside. Um, so uh, that proposal has been submitted and I look forward to the town of Elon's um, consideration of that. Dr. Williams, you and I both have been part of some of those conversations as well, and I wonder if you have anything else that you might want to, to add or offer to the president's comments. Yeah, you know, I've enjoyed having those conversations, particularly with the students. You know, we've spoken with colleagues, a number of colleagues as well, but uh, having the, those candid conversations with students about what they're experiencing and how we might do better to support them uh, during this particular period. And you know, what I'm finding is just really creating spaces so they can hear from us in a humanized type way, not just as administrators, not just as faculty members, as staff members, but just again, as caring human beings, you know, people who can relate to and understand how they might be feeling during this time. So it's really essentially, you know, the degree to which we as a community can uh, convey empathy during this period of time 
it breeds a sense of confidence that, you know, I am not alone as a student in this experience. You know, there are others who are with me uh, in this process. So I think that ability, when, whenever we have it as colleagues, as peers, uh, to the students as well, to, to lend a, lift, a li listening ear and to engage with people to genuinely ask, you know, how are you doing? No, really, how are you doing? And how might we, uh, I point you in the direction of the many resources that Elon offers here. I think that is really important, you know, just you've heard me say this before, Dr. Dooley, of us employing some of our uh, small C counseling skills. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be from a, a clinical counseling perspective, but we all have the ability to listen, to convey empathy, to summarize, and to direct where resources may be. So I think that we collectively as a workforce, as a group of peers uh, with for our students, uh, to direct and to employ some of these skills that can be used in our per that we use in our personal lives with our families and those that, that closely matter to us. And so I think we can extend some of those practices and skills uh, in working with our students. Uh, and collectively, when you are having a community that's working together, uh, thinking about this um, small C counseling, as I'm calling it, I think we would have somewhat of a healthier community uh, for sure, because it, it relates that you matter, rela relationships are important, and students are at the core of this. And so we wanna keep that focus at hand. And as we keep the focus on students, we know too that we have colleagues who are supporting as well. So I would say that should be extended to our colleagues and checking in with our colleagues as well. So how are you doing? No, really, how are you doing? Dr. Williams, you referenced coming together and some of the conversations you and I have been um, in connected to this week relate to a question that we just received about, um, today the Black Student Union has planned a march at 3.30, take back our streets in response to the caravan that went through town. Uh, and the question was, how are you providing or showing support to these students? And I've really been proud of the students who've been working on this and we've been working with them this week in different offices to see their leadership in doing just what you described in terms of coming together, um, showing as a community that we don't tolerate uh, the kind of hate that experienced uh, through our campus um, and to take back the streets to make Williamson and Haggard uh, a space for our community. I just wonder if you have any, I know you're speaking at the, at the uh, uh, gathering later today and I wonder if you have any comments about the work the students have been doing. Yeah, yeah. Like you, Dr. Dooley, I too am uh, really proud of our students for taking this sort of a, a strength-based response to the adversity that's at hand, uh, and that's racism and sexism that uh, was displayed on our campus during that convo and that ride. And so responded with a sense that, you know, I am not just a victim to this. I am a part of a, unfortunately, on the, uh, on the un unfortunate side of uh, a situation, but I have abilities. I can have respond in a way where I'm not at from a deficit, you know, and I could corral and come together and coordinate with my with my peers, use the resources of the administration. And so when you and I were able to gather with the students and sort of help clarify what is it that you want to do with this demonstration to help them understand, to give them the words to, to communicate why they want to come together this afternoon at 3.30. And when they say this is a point of solidarity, solidarity amongst students, amongst faculty, staff, and administrators, that is what we should be doing. We should be the bridge of you know, the things that students have in their minds and their hearts that they want to do. And we being vehicle to helping them actualize those things. So I was grateful to be a part of the discussions along with you to help the student leaders in this demonstration to put it together. Uh, they get full credit for this and we're playing the background to support them as we as we can. And you know, I, I, I'm looking forward to sharing a few comments with them today upon their request. Uh, now, not that I asked to be a part of this, but they see that I might add some value to this event today. And, uh, and I want to respond in a way that will be align with their wishes. Um, so I think this is one way to support our, our students uh, and is take back the, our streets uh, demonstration today. So that's a really good question from our viewer. And I want to um, sort of transition to uh, the questions we've gotten to about the election. And, and I think they relate to the convoy insofar as that um, it, it felt like it started as a political uh, event there. And during the fireside chat with SGA, President Book received several questions uh, regarding the upcoming election. Uh, there was one student who asked, what advice can you give to students who are anxious about being on campus after election day? Uh, another student asked, what are you doing to ensure that students, particularly students of color, feel safe and supported during and after the election? 
Um, and we had a question that came in uh, while we were on the broadcast here about, it's fair to assume that the outcome of the election will be contested. Some groups have been urged to take up arms. Does the university have a plan in the event that there's unrest in, or violence in Alamance County following the election? And I know Dr. Williams and Dr. Valetti and I, we've been working with uh, folks from student life and academic affairs to come together to, to talk about the election. And you know, certainly we have a number of things that are coming up in the weeks to come to support student engagement in voting and making sure that they're registered. Um, by this point in time, October 2nd, we hope that every student has a plan for how they're going to vote um, this fall and is, is taking action on that plan. Um, but really after this contested election, how are we gonna come together as a nation? And what does that mean for us here on campus as we think about coming together? So, um, you know, lots of conversations have been happening about um, how to support folks in the way forward. Uh, certainly we also know um, from a university perspective, our university police do work with local, state and federal agencies to address any intelligence about activities of hate groups um, or other groups. And, and we'll certainly strengthen those efforts in the weeks leading up to the election and beyond. Um, Dr. Williams, Dr. Book, Dr. Vladi, I wonder if any of you have any other thoughts that you want to offer about these questions that folks are asking about the upcoming election. We'll see who's going to volunteer to, to, to go first here. I'll just echo what you, we told the students to. And um, I wrote a letter to the um, incoming class that I was also a first year freshman uh, undergrad went during an election year, a very um, uh, volatile election period. And I remember casting my first vote um, and registering to vote and just the personal responsibility of that and the importance of um, entering, you know, that that moment in our adulthood of being part of citizenship and and being part of a voice about who gets to lead our country and who gets to lead in our um, state and uh, other elections. So it is critical uh, for students to participate. This is part of um, uh, arriving to this moment in your life and in the we you need to be an informed voter too so in that plan is also understanding the issues the referendums um, the other uh, elements that will be on that ballot um, and we need people to be informed um, when they go out to vote uh, that is just the foundation it's a it's a sacred moment in our democracy and it's the foundation of our country Dr. Radigan Rohr, I wonder, at, at the vice president's table, we often turn to you for wisdom and perspective and to bring things together for us. And I wonder if you have some thoughts about this question. Well, we acknowledge that students might be feeling, some students might be feeling anxious or, or even fearful. Students are not living in a vacuum. They read, they see, they, they experience what they did last week. Um, they hear the rhetoric and like the rest of us, they too are experiencing the, the divisiveness in the country. And that is certainly only highlighted by the fact that this is clearly the most significant election in their lifetime, right? So, in, and in the middle of all of this, we're also still asking of our, of our students to learn, to grow, to reflect. I, I love what I just heard about students wanting, what I've been reading about students wanting to, to take our streets back, about students not wanting to feel like victims. And so for me, this is a time that we might look to agency, right? How might we help our students navigate and figure out not only how to learn in this moment, but how to be, and yes, how to excel in a world, in a world even with all the uncertainty and the messiness and the chaos. I also believe that we need to create spaces for open discussions around the election results in and outside of class. So come November 4th, we need to ensure that these spaces are there for our students to openly discuss their feelings about what's going on. And when you talk about those open spaces, Dr. Redinger, I think that's really important because we are a campus after all that really embraces uh, freedom of thought and liberty of conscience. And, and some of those open spaces over the next coming weeks have gotta be about the issues that are involved in this election. Um, and I think as a community, I said it last week, but 
I mean, we got a question here about um, the ways that we are supporting the community discussing these issues and, and several questions about how do we re support Republican students and others. And, and I think that, that we need to be able to have some really important discussions about the future of our nation and our communities and the political process. And I believe that we can do that without having to resort to uh, racist comments or name calling or all those kinds of things that we really can find ways to come together as university community to live out our values um, and also to have political differences um, and to embrace that on campus. And I, I hope that is the culture of our campus um, as we move forward to the election and through the election um, moving forward as well. Absolutely. I mean, we have to think about it at the heart of a liberal arts education is the inclusion of diverse voices, right? Well, I want to end our discussion today in the time that we have left with, a, I, which I thought was a provocative question from a student um, who asked, do you think there will be long-term changes in the way Elon normally operates due to the impacts of coronavirus? If so, what are they? Dr. Vladi, do you wanna offer maybe just a couple of quick thoughts on, on that question? Happy to, that's a great question. Um, uh, there certainly will be changes that, let me put it out there first. Uh, but having said that, what will not change though is our focus on engaged in experiential learning, regardless of the modality, right? Students will have enriching experiences that are relationship rich. That's a hallmark of Elon education. So regardless of the technology, regardless of the modality, that is not going to change. Having said that, um, my thoughts are the future will be combining the in-class experiences with engaged learning, the outside the classroom experiences, that are uh, technology assisted uh, and, and learning a different way. Right? Um, we are finding that people uh, yearn for in-person experience, like just like we are what we're going through right now with the COVID experience and stuff. Like I said, whether I talk to the students in my class, whether I talk to individuals, including ourselves, we are missing the person to person or human to human interaction. Uh, I think it's especially came into focus when we are isolated, having conversations such as this, as opposed to a town hall meeting, back and forth. We miss those things, right? So I think those will um, those will continue to happen. Um, we're also finding that technology is enabling us to do a lot more things which we didn't realize we could do before, right? For example, if I'm having a class and I want an expert who is a CEO of a company or uh, a, a, a scientist from other institution, et cetera. It was a big deal. In other words, you had to find two or three days, if not three days, at least one or two days of this individual's time to come on campus, you know, engage your students, et cetera. But right now, if they have like an hour or two using these kind of virtual technologies, they can, they can engage students and the students are benefiting from those experiences, et cetera. So those are some of the things that um, technology is enabling us to do. Um, I anticipate that the, the technology will add richness to the residential experience rather than replacing it. So it's um, uh, the technology enabling our residential campus and learning. Uh, so it's an and proposition and it's not a residential or remote learning experience. So suspect technology is not going away. Uh, the remote instruction is not going to go away. It'll still be a part of it. But what will not change as part of Elon is the a relationship rich, engaged learning that we're very proud. Very good. President Book, I want to give you the last word on this question of the long term changes to the impact of that Elon here. Well, I, I just will say I thought Provost Valetti captured very well this, um, you know, the power of a, a technology enabled residential campus experience. And uh, one thing that gives me a lot of um, excitement about what the future holds for us is how quickly we all learned all of these new tools uh, to do our work, right? I've learned four new, I know Teams, I know WebEx, I know um, Zoom, uh, a Skype for business. <laughs> so I've, uh, just the fact that we all are learning all of these new tools so quickly from students to faculty and staff and, and the creativity of how can I accomplish what I want to do and what I, how can I accomplish my goal in this new world? All of us, our brains are working and adapting to this new environment and the creativity. Um, just think of all of the new businesses we have seen launch uh, because of the demands right now and of things that we're learning. Um, 
I will say it has changed uh, when, when I think about sitting down with people masked, the, that moment means something different to me now because I, um, I'm on a very Zoom efficient call, right? And I finished that and now what I need is something different from that face-to-face -face moment. Um, I'll be glad when it's over. I was walking down the sidewalk um, yesterday and it's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful series of days right now in North Carolina, spectacular. And I was walking down the sidewalk. I just finished calling uh, that bingo for the students. And I thought to myself, will I be wearing a mask October 1st, 2021? You know, it, you know, and trying, and I think we're all doing that, trying to wonder what our world will look like. So I love this question because uh, this, you know, the students thinking is, what is the Elon experience going to look like? Uh, I just want to reassure the students that we're in this together, uh, that we're all doing that thinking too, and uh, and and know that Elon and our community partnership will arrive at that, a very powerful endpoint of all of this. Thank you. Thanks, President Book. Uh, and I want to thank everyone who's joined us today. Uh, for those of you who are here on campus, I do hope you have some time this afternoon to take advantage of that unbelievably gorgeous Carolina blue sky and the weather that we have here on campus. I want to say thank you to my colleagues who are part of this town hall this afternoon, and certainly to thank the Elon students, families, faculty, and staff who submitted some great questions for us to address. Uh, we'd ask you please join us again next Friday at 1.30 in this same space. We look forward to continuing this discussion and sharing important information with the entire Elon community. Thanks for being with us today.